A very good morning to you. My name is Daniel Wahome and welcome to Sports Check on the 15th day of March 2021. And it is a time when we've got the continuation of the restriction of movement. And this was after the executive order that was that was issued by President Uhuru Kenyatta on Friday. So lots to talk about. And also, some, one story that everyone has been talking about over the past few weeks that we will be keeping up on is comedian Eric Omondi, who is going to be meeting with the Kenya Film Classification Board. And this is after he was arrested and t you know, held at Central Police Station, charged and released at the court of law on bond and this is because of filming something that had not been approved by the Kenya Film Classification Board. So he's meeting with them trying to get an out of court settlement on the matter. That's part of the news that our team is going to be covering this morning. But we shall be getting into three conversations about sport and the first is about two, two events that will be hosted in Kenya and this are going to be having some of the best golfers in the world. We're talking about the magical Kenya Open and the inaugural edition of the Kenya Savannah Classic. We will be getting into a conversation about that and the sponsorship around golf and how it can be used to, number one, promote the country as a destination and also become a good source of income and brand recognition for the country. We shall also be talking about age-grade coaching. How important is it? to keep tabs on an athlete from when they are nine all the way to the time they are 23 when they are an adult and how you can keep track on uh, their uh, performance in training and in the competitions where they are and in addition to that know how they should manage media and all that to improve on their brand management the final conversations will be about football and there is a change of guard at the confederation of african football south african Billionaire Dr. Patrice Motsepe was elected as the CAF president and opposed, actually through acclamation. And there was also a change in the CAF executive committee and the representation of Africa at the FIFA Council and also a change of guard at the secretariat with the new general secretary. What's the impact of this and what does it mean for African football? Plus also remember the Harambe Stars playing against Tanzania friendly at 3 p.m. All those conversations over the next two hours with our panel of guests and we shall get straight into that. Our sign language interpreter this morning is Lenta Odingo. She is the lady who's on the bottom right of your screen. And straight into a fast interview and this is about events that have changed you know the trust of kenya outside the country we are talking about the magical kenya open and the kenya savannah classic two events that will be taking place back to back the magical kenya open starts on the 18th and runs through the 21st that is from thursday the golfers take a one day uh, rest and then from the 22nd or rather the 23rd that is Tuesday next week to the 26th. We shall have the inaugural edition of the Kenya Savannah Classic. And we're going to get into a conversation with one person who has been involved with this tournament. He's not directly involved now in the event management of the Magical Kenya Open. He is Peter Gashero, who is the Chief Executive Officer of IMG Kenya Limited. Peter, very good morning to you. Uh, good morning. Thank you for having me. And let's start first with, you know, the whole concept of the Kenya Savannah Classic. And it is the inaugural edition. The European Tour decided that they are going to have two back-to-back -back events. What was, you know, the reaction from the golfing society and people who are involved, you know, with this event, their reaction and what it means for the country? I think this was basically a very good uh, move by the European Tour to... Um, Given the COVID situation, we need, they needed to ensure that the players get more play uh, without necessarily having to travel from country to country. And therefore, an opportunity arose in the calendar following some consolation of other events to give the players another opportunity to play a second um, European tour uh, event immediately after the Magical Kenya Open. So this was a bonus to Kenya in terms of our visibility as a country and a huge opportunity for our local pros to play a second European tour event right here in the country, um, while also giving um, the more than 150 uh, European players who are part of the circuit an opportunity to play an extra event, given that quite a number of events in the circuit over the last 12 months had to be cancelled. So for us uh, as a country, I think we should be really proud and uh, we're really privileged to have the opportunity to, to host two European tour events.
for those who are not coffers, they might not know. Uh, basically, this is the second highest level of actually, I was coming in the to world. that. Yes, <laughs> I was actually coming to that because I think on Saturday at the National Park, um, the captain, uh, uh, PGK professional golfers captain CJ Wangai mentioned it. Yes, this is basically from here. There's only one level up, which would be uh, the PGA. I think the, the Kenya uh, Golf Union and the K KOGL have done well to try and organize a local tour, which has now been running very well for the last three years, to give them an opportunity to, to play locally uh, and while also bringing some players from the region. But this actually does give our players an opportunity to play two uh, European tour events. And we hope that as we get past COVID, uh, we expect that um, Kenyans will start traveling to other European tour events. They will be able to play to the level where they can actually uh, get the ticket to go to the next level. And this brings in another aspect, which means that our golfers now have got to learn how to extract the value of our competitions. And they've gotten the opportunity from uh, the Kenya Open Golf Limited, the Safari Tour is there, they've play, uh, they played in Uganda, no event uh, in Rwanda and Tanzania as expected uh, over the past one season. But what's required of them now, given the kind of exposure that they have, and they have got to consistently do interviews you know, after every round of golf? First, let me say that uh, not just for the Kenyan pros, but uh, for all the players that will be participating in this event, um, they've not had that much exposure throughout the, throughout the year. So they will be tested um, really as to how they adapt uh, into a competition situation uh, as soon as the Magical Kenya opens. In fact, our pros probably have a slightly better advantage given that uh, our golf courses were open with, you know, fewer restrictions compared to uh, golf courses in Europe where most of them were on a complete lockdown. So we will be uh, expecting uh, that they would be, you know, uh, get using that edge to see a better performance this year from our Kenyan pros. Something that I'd uh, like to mention is now how do they then adapt, uh, especially when com uh, to engage the public and, you know, bring the non-golfing community to follow them because en fan engagement especially now online and everything, is a new way? Uh, I think sports in general, we've learned that uh, we cannot rely on uh, on-venue interaction. I think Kenyan sports will be the first to really um, take a hit, all sports, generally because we had an over-reliance on uh, our gate collections, an over-reliance on our sponsors coming on ground and having the activations on ground. Now, that's not going to be possible going forward and we need to adapt to the new normal and for the new normal for all our sports now is television we have to depend heavily on television uh, broadcasters would have to come in and help all sports so that we can actually get an opportunity to interact not with our fans uh, give our sponsors our mileage and the other space that is of course available to all of us uh, as sports federations is the digital space uh, we've taken We've been slow adapters, but some are doing very well, but it's time that we all stepped up and went up to the next level because the digital space gives us an opportunity to have an almost one-on-one -on -one interaction, a direct interaction with our fans, which is um, what will bring value uh, or be the closest things to having people in the stands. And with this, how much of the adaptation have you seen with our, golfer, uh, with our golfers, um, knowing that some of their backgrounds, they're very reserved people, I've got to say, but when you meet them on the course, they can be bubbly. What's required of them so that, you know, like it is always said, if you're going to attract the public, then have some form of, you know, in as much as, you know, you're a reserved person, have a way of connecting with the public. Um, our pros need to step up. I think we have uh, about uh, 16 pros uh, on the field. Um, they will need to step up. We haven't seen a lot of them engaging a lot uh, on the social media platforms, uh, but they will need to step up. They will need to up their skills for interacting even with media in terms of interviews. Uh, of course, uh, in the coming, for the two events that are coming, there will be a few more complications in terms of 
even the media's access mm -hmm. uh, to the pros, given that they will be playing in a bubble. They will not be, uh, they will not be able, for example, to leave the bubble and come to the studio. Uh, but there are some media who have been accredited to be part of that bubble. And how they take advantage of live interviews uh, that will be taking place, uh, there would be uh, of utmost importance. So my personal appeal would be to them is that they shouldn't shy away from the media. They should take an opportunity to talk to both local and international media that will be uh, at the venue at the current club um, and also take time to um, engage uh, and tell us about their game. It might be, and this cuts across for all the sports, even where we are kings like in athletics, in the marathon, we, we don't see a lot of personalized engagement uh, from our marathoners, from our athletes. And that's what actually uh, creates a fun engagement. And I remember sometime last year, you were engaged by the National Olympic Committee of Kenya to talk about this engagement. And uh, one of the challenges that always comes out, and I'll use a, um, a good example of uh, Dismas Indiza, his Swahili interviews are hilarious. He has a way that he can connect What's the use of the, lang uh, the use of the language that is, uh, because we say there is no language that is tied to media. What would be the best thing for the golfers to do? I know some can converse well in English, others are comfortable in Swahili. How do they then make use of that? I think our basic thinking number one has been to encourage all our sportsmen to take interviews in the language that they are most comfortable with. However, that said, uh, we are also realizing that they need to invest in their brand building off the truck, off the pitch. And that brand building simply means you have, uh, you have to up your uh, language skills across uh, various languages. We did a research recently and actually just, and, and you can, anybody can Google this, you'll actually see some of our top tennis athletes would speak up to five or ten languages. Uh -huh. As, as when they go to different um, um, uh, countries. If he's playing in the Italian Open, he's going to take an interview in Italian. If he's playing in, in the Spanish Open, he'll take an interview in, Sp in, in Spanish. And the reason being is that if you do not engage with, um, uh, with your fans directly, uh, through a translator, it's not the same. So number one, we encourage them, please take this in the language that you're most comfortable with. Ask for help. Uh, so that we can actually, um, we sometimes have over time assumed that, you know, we, are, we, we, we look down upon a person who cannot speak English. So sometimes we find people are trying to go into a language that they are not comfortable with. I should be comfortable enough to say, I need help on Swahili. If I'm going to take an interview in Swahili, uh, what are the words I should use and so on. And I can actually rehearse and train and so that if I go to a French-speaking country, then I can. I spend a lot of years um, uh, in my personal capacity with the Badminton World Federation. And one of the challenges that we had there was that we had a number of top players with global appeal who are Chinese, but they could only speak Chinese. And therefore, we were unable to put them in front of... Um, the big networks globally, which were actually controlling the funding. And as a result, the sport did not grow. And you will find that uh, the stardom of individual athletes does bring the entire sport up. So you will find that if uh, Lewis Hamilton wasn't taking interviews in English, you would find that we would not be having that kind of popular following you have in this country, and so on. Uh, now, something else that I want now to bring in when it comes to golf is the involvement of amateur golfers at this event. What's the kind of exposure that they've got and the feedback that they've given? Uh, we can look back at the 2019 um, Magical Kenya Open where the two junior golfers actually got uh, mementos in the form of uh, salvers for their participation. How much of a change does it give to them? I think first we must say that uh uh, the Kenya Open in itself has, you know, I think it's now in this 52nd year and, and it has been growing. So the event itself seemed to have been moving almost faster than our level of play. Uh -huh. So um, you remember we used to, uh, three years ago, we were on the European uh, the challenge, challenge, tour. challenge Tour. The event moved 
to, to the main tour while we actually didn't have pros that are actually in that level. So number one, for us to host this event and since the hosts are allowed slots where they can actually bring in people who have not necessarily qualified, gives us an opportunity to bring our level up. So we expect that with a number of years with this kind of exposure that we should actually get some players moving up. Uh, the organizers went on to create the safari tour because the, the, the complaint we had four years ago, three years ago, is that our pros were not getting enough events to actually prepare for this Kenya Open and very few actually made the cut, if you remember. Yes. So with that now we are seeing a little bit, they have had, I think they've played us, um, the entire leg for the last three years, giving them an opportunity to be in competition, giving them an opportunity to actually also make some money along the way, give value to their sponsors. Um, and then by the virtue of us hosting, and this is something we hope that other federations could take up. You know, if we hosted the World Cup, the FIFA World Cup, automatically Kenya qualify. Harambe stars would be, <laughs> yes. would be in the field. You, you get my point. So it would give us an opportunity to play. So the same case with the European Tour, with the Magical Kenya Open. Uh, Kenya as host is allowed some amateurs who they have put in, so they have taken the best amateurs they have put in. And the idea is to give them exposure at a very, very high level. As we said, this is the only level higher than this is PGA. So... So this actually should be help us. And because we've, we, we are having juniors below 18 who are playing very, very well, um, golf is a sport that they could actually play for many years to come. So in five years, in six years, we expect these junior golfers not just to be now you know, playing on the wild card when we are hosting, but to be able to qualify uh, to enter maybe the challenge tour on their own merit and move on to the to the main tour so that we can actually uh, start seeing Kenyans. We are seeing the same thing with the ladies golf. Um, I think we hosted uh, in 2019 the yes. first European tour uh, ladies golf open in Vipingo. We didn't have any lady golfers per se pros in the event, but we are then exposing our ladies to a very high level of of, of our championship. So we hope this then encourages and you start seeing as you continue to host this event from a sports development point of view that we're also getting more and more golfers uh, moving in from the amateur ranks to, to the pro. And we're not, we're not just playing uh, the leisure, the recreational sport uh, that most of us do play. Something else happened and uh, I think this was decided I think in 2018 a harsh, uh, what was considered by golfers a very harsh decision is the kind of scores that they used to post. And it was decided that on the safari tour, on day one, if you do not, I mean, if you play higher than 86 uh, on the course, then or four, uh, 86 or 14 over, whichever is higher, then you are you basically face the day one cut. What was the impact on the tour with that decision that was made? Uh, well, um, I think what the, the, the advice this is that they need to ensure that the safari tour as a championship starts coming up. Mm -hmm. The safari tours, the, 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 the vision of the, uh, or the creators of the safari tour is that this tour should on its own be a big enough tour to one day compete with the European tour. So the standards of play at that event need to start going up. Otherwise, um, uh, we cannot you know, put it at the same level as a recreational play. So it's an, an opportunity for our pros to step up, move to the next level. Uh, they are competing tours. Uh, we know the Sunshine Tour that also mm -hmm. comes into Nairobi uh, once a year. We want the Safari Tour to go to the level where I mean, now we have one leg in, uh, in Uganda and another one in Tanzania. But if you are to go and have global recognition, or at least regional recognition, the level of play must be up. So our pros have to step up. Those rules are not meant to, you know, to hurt them, but actually just push them to the next level so that we can actually start seeing better quality play at the tour. Something that has happened is that um, somehow um, Kenya has got, I think, outside of South Africa and Zimbabwe and no other country has got more golf courses than Kenya. But we've seen professional golfers from Nigeria, from Uganda coming in and also uh, Robson Chinoy, who's basically be almost become a Kenyan, uh, given the kind of things he says and the banter he gets from the likes of uh, Indiza. What 
kind of attraction then does it mean for the local circuit when you have Andrew Odo from Nigeria, Philip Kasozi from Uganda, and Chinoy from Zimbabwe playing against our best? Um, yes, we have probably the best courses in the region. Um, historically, um, golf was basically played as a recreational sport here um, with not a lot of emphasis on the pros. Um, but we're seeing now that there's a lot of effort in the last couple of years to create a junior golf to ensure that there is funding being put there. There is effort uh, being put into developing and to tapping talent. Uh, previously, it was you know, almost by accident the people who actually made it to, to the pro level. So we will see in a couple of years a different uh, breed of of, of uh, the ju current junior golfers moving to the next level. We've seen uh, young ones actually qualify, getting scholarships abroad on golf uh, in the last couple of years. So in the next, so on, the development on the golf side, I think is going very well. Now, in terms of exposing uh, our players or preparing them for the Kenya Open for the safari, through the safari tour, we can't have it both ways. We can't lock it up just for local pros and then say that that's how we're preparing them. We need to expose them at least to the region. They need to be exposed to at least some competition so that they're not, you know, if we just compete among ourselves like we did before the Kenya previously, then we thought we were okay. And then come the Kenya Open, no Kenyan made the cut. We want to move away from that. And I think encouraging a little bit of this regional um, players to join the tour is good for us. But at the same time, our pros should also start stepping out. I think we've seen uh, this year uh, and the last two years now, um, some corporates coming in to support our local pros. They should start investing this to participate in other tours so that they can actually up their game. And when we talk, uh, when we talk about, by the way, the, in the growth of this, think of awards that would go out now to the amateur golfers before I even get back, you know, to looking at how, you know, you are getting the professionals themselves, you know, uh, on TV. Amateur golfers, they're not entitled to money, but there's always that thrill when you have an amateur golfer performing so well. I think in 2016, it was at Karen, uh, uh, yes, it was at, uh, also at Karen, when uh, Romain Langasque was the best performing amateur golfer, finished second, but took home that salva that has been won by say, somebody like, uh, you know, Mr. Ben Okello, his son Jacob Okello, uh, we have David Farah, and also we have, you know, Colin Domondi, all those people who've won that. How much growth then do we see from a transition from amateur golf and also now to professional golf when that salva is actually picked up by someone on merit? So number one, I think our amateur golfers are probably uh, cannot complain in terms of tournaments. I think there is a tournament, two tournaments every weekend. Yes. <laughs> throughout the year. I mean, for the amateur golf championship, they have about 18. So they actually they are actually more active than our professionals. Yes. So this is giving them an opportunity to competition and actually see. And the club systems are quite good to actually uh, gauge amateurs to the time where they can actually now make a conscious decision to move. Uh, sports is governed by, by rules and for amateur golf it's very clear that there is a limit to how much you can actually uh, give as, as, as a price. The, the, there is a, 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 a limit to that and that actually works to the benefit of, of, of golf um, in total because what happens is that because there is a ceiling to how much um, price money or total value of a price could be. A lot of sponsors have found it very easy to go into that place and have an amateur competition without feeling uh, the pressure of having to, to, to put in a big budget. That has actually worked for golf and therefore it's a good limit. So the call is on the, on the golfer themselves to see, am I then now good enough to, to jump to the other side? And, and that decision really would be informed by performance. And because they have an opportunity, and this is the opportunity that the Kenya Golf uh, Limited is offering them, that our top amateurs uh, have an opportunity to play against the world's best. This gives an opportunity to gauge themselves and say, am I good enough now to move on? I mean, I think it would be uh, not a good 
uh, use of the opportunity if you remain the top amateur played in the Kenya Open three times and you're not even moving across. We want to see that if you got an opportunity to gauge yourself, find that, yes, I'm now good enough, then you just turn pro and go to the next level. Yeah. Actually, yeah, makes me think of one player. He had a great outing, I think, was it back uh, five or so years ago, but turned pro late. And then here comes the question. You've mentioned about restrictions on the value of the prize money. And I'm trying to think of a situation where you've got a hole in one and there's a car to be worn. What happens in that scenario for amateur golfers? <laughs> I, 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 I'm sure there are rules around that and I'm, I'm not the person for it. Uh, you know, uh, the hole in one basically is one of the things that's put in there as, uh, as we call it, some frills to add some fun, some engagement uh, into the sport. It's not, you know, you can't really put it as part of the, 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 the game itself. Uh, I think this year um, we've seen that uh, I think Johnny Walker has put in um, some prize money for hole-in-one, uh, which is, goes beyond <laughs> what um, an amateur is allowed to earn. But I think the, the referees, uh, the tournament organizers, the technical director are the best person to, to answer this. Um, there is actually quite... Uh, golf has an elaborate set of rules. Uh, people actually go to study them. So I will not uh, uh, speak for them because I haven't gone through those tough courses. Um, there, but it would actually be an interesting thing uh, to actually see. Well, interesting. Talking about a hole in one, um, in uh, 2017, Oliver Lindell of Finland, he did win a Ford Ranger. I think he decided to cash it in because in Finland they drive left and uh, drive cars. He decided to carry a check in his pocket at the par 313th. What's the excitement that a hole in one brings? at any event, whether it be a club night, a corporate night, or even a professional event amongst the golfing, you know, society? I think it brings a lot of talkability. We do always put a top of the range vehicle that is usually available. I think one year was a brand new Mercedes Benz or a Range Rover, uh, uh, an Isuzu, um, BMW for the European Tour at Wentworth and so on. The talkability, uh, the level of skill required, and a good amount of luck to actually get a hole in one uh, creates a lot of talkability. So, in terms of uh, media value, in terms of media uh, engagement with the fans, even if you are not um, a die hard golf fan, you'd, all of us understand what a hole in one is. And that is what um, the value it brings to the sport. Um, Every sport is trying to get engagement, not just with a diehard fan, but also somebody who doesn't follow the sport uh, keenly would be able to understand. Um, and that's why some, some sports seem to get more television, more engagement than others, because they have things that are very easy to pick up and understand. That's why it's easy for us, for example, to follow athletics, uh, because it's very easy. You, 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 the person who gets to the rope fast, they don't put the rope anymore, but the person who gets the <laughs> rope fast is obviously the winner. Uh, but most of us watching a sport like cricket would be lost for half of the time. Yeah. I know everyone. <laughs> <laughs> I would laugh that because I mean, I'm known to be a little bit crazy about cricket. And people get confused. What are you doing looking at people who are just hitting a ball that's flying all over? Yeah, what are wickets and I don't know what are runs. We don't know what those are. <laughs> Well, a lot of education will come through and, you know, through the broadcast of golf. And let's now talk about putting money into a tournament that has got a prize fund of 1 million euros. And at today's exchange rate, I just did a quick check, that is 131 million shillings. And I think the Kenya Tourism Board has put in about 25 million for this tour event and also... Kenya breweries have also put in and a lot of government support and all this. So the, the sponsorship way for these institutions and the kind of money they put in, maybe you could explain how it works because some, go in, some are in kind, others are in cash. So basically sports is a, a big business. Every uh, sporting event that is staged locally, globally, is, has a big 
business parts to it. And you need the business because uh, that's how you actually fund the staging of the event. That's how you fund the, the, the uh, payment for the officials, payment for the grounds, and all the work that you need to do has to be funded uh, somehow. Now, from a sponsor perspective, uh, there are various things that people would look at before putting in their money into a sport, including a government, for example. So if you are to divide it into category, the, 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 the one first one that is most obvious is usually a marketing budget. If you go to a sponsor, you'll probably be looking at his marketing budget. The issue with the marketing budget is that it must be able to provide a hard sale. The person must be able, the sponsor must be able to see value that will directly affect their bottom line. They must see something that will affect their sales. They must see something that will affect their brand value uh, that, that would then encourage them to put in. Because I always tell a lot of uh, federations that I talk to that your competition is, for example, a billboard. Your competition is a newspaper advert. So when you ask a sponsor to put in money at your event, he's actually weighing, do I give you the money or do I put the money on a billboard? What gives me better engagement? Uh -huh. What gives me better value? So that's the same approach to the Magical Kenya Open. The, that's the same approach to any, the European uh, Premier League. That's the approach. The other that there's also funds that are usually available within our sponsors that go into... Um, as, as, as good corporate citizens, that they have funds that they would use for CSR, and there is a duty for them, for example, this year, we've seen Vision 2030, we've seen Kenya Tourism Board, we've seen Johnny Walker, all coming in very strongly to support our local pros. So that might not come directly from what they would get in marketing, but there would be somewhere we are saying, as Kenyans, as good citizens, would like to support our pros, to, to actually shine, so that they will actually bring the national pride that we are looking for and so on. We could also be looking at places where some of those funds would go into development. Yeah. Uh -huh. So you're not looking for direct uh, return in terms of a marketing or commercial value, but you're looking for putting in money into development of the sports or looking at development. So in the case of, of the Magical Kenya Open, the biggest value is in television. Uh, that all European tour events are actually televised globally across a huge amount of network. I think the estimate is about 450 million homes will be subscribed and watching f at least four hours of live television from Nairobi, uh, both locally within the continent, uh, in the US, uh, and very big in Europe. So there is a lot of value there for any brand that is trying to position itself and definitely uh, Magical Kenya as a brand sees a lot of value and the government in, in that. Now, then here comes the issue. There is a local brand, for example, who may sponsor an event and a brand that cuts across um, the world. Then how do you balance the two and optimize what the availabilities that are there, um, social media interactions, um, people at times, maybe TikTok, at times people think it's just jokes, but it's getting to be something serious, Instagram, Twitter, and obviously the biggest funder of sport in the world currently, television. There is definitely big value for local sponsors who are just looking at the local market to be part of this event and to be part of an event like this, uh, not just this one. Number one is that um, this event is going to get uh, local television also. It's going to be available on some networks. It's going to have big following. We expect that in the 10 days, um, the event will enjoy primetime news, which is very difficult to get in uh, during even a normal time. So that, number one, gives it a primary. We will get primary coverage across media mm -hmm. and normally I know the KOGL is very good on their social media handles, the European Tour is very good on their social media handles. So in terms of mileage, uh, sponsors who are looking to talk into Kenya get a lot of mileage, a lot of interaction at that level and it's also a very good brand uh, building tool for them to be associated with the event.
Now, here comes the big challenge. No fans will be at the Magical Kenya Open at the Kenya Savannah Classic because the event is going to operate in a bubble format. It simply means on uh, that's tomorrow or by latest Wednesday morning, you check into your hotel, and the moment you check in your hotel, it's on the bus to Karen back to the hotel, and that's for the next, you know, 11 or 12 nights. So it's a bubble format. You won't interact, even if your house is just right across Karen or just across your hotel, you can't leave. And that means a lot of uh, activations. How much has it changed, you know, how you monitor and evaluate a brand that you are overseeing or, work, or a client that, you know, that you're working with? Let me say that first, uh, the first time we heard about this bubble was, I think, when the Bundesliga came back, or the first league mm -hmm. to come back, a big league that came back, then the NBA and so on. And we had everybody's in a bubble and we were trying to just figure out. Um, and it became obvious that the reason that these leagues were actually going back is because they understood that despite the fact that they would attract huge, uh, huge numbers into their stadiums, they also had a huge television audience and this television audience was providing, generating enough revenue to keep the league going. So it is, was how do we operate within uh, the COVID um, environment and still be able to deliver quality sports uh, to our viewers. So we started seeing that last year, we saw the London Marathon, which normally has 50,000 participants going down to 100 um, elite athletes uh, and then we get then the opportunity in Kenya to actually experience what this is. So what we'll be seeing for the next few days, and I had the opportunity this weekend to uh, go to the venue, uh, also go to the hotel and just see what is happening, it is complete demarcation. There are places in the club yesterday I could not go to because I have not entered the bubble. Uh -huh. So to enter the bubble, you need to get tested fast, and once in it, is having a situation where everybody in there has already tested negative and we can be sure that that area is uh, virus free so that they can actually get an opportunity to interact freely although within the bubble they're being asked to also maintain their social distance uh, just to be 100 percent sure and then there will be regular rapid tests done in the course of this we it will be very good for uh, our sports uh, men and women to actually follow what is happening closely because this is what our athletes are going to be subjected to when we go to Tokyo. When you go to Tokyo, I think they've already put out the playbook. They'll be, we'll be tested before we leave, we'll be tested when we arrive, we'll be tested every four days and we, we, we are yet to see how this actually pans out. What happens if I turn positive the day before my competition? It basically means I'm out. Well, you know, and the Magical Kenya Open is actually giving an, for us an opportunity to actually see maybe this is the future of sports, or at least for the next one or two years until we are totally rid of the, uh, of the, of the virus. We have big competitions scheduled for the year. We have the World Athletics Under 20, which will probably operate with the same rules, which will be hosted. So this is a really good opportunity for us to see how a venue can be... Um, demarcated to ensure that people do not interact. The other thing is that it has given us an opportunity to ask ourselves what is the real value. I've had a struggle this last week to discuss if we are having no fans at the, at, at the, at the club, in this case the current club where they go, should I still be, be able to sponsor? And it's giving us an opportunity to say, is there value? Where are you getting the value and the questions? Because sometimes we get lost in being at the venue and not seeing the value. But it has helped us actually evaluate, is there a real value uh, that we are getting? And we would actually see that with the television and the digital plans that have been put in place, we are actually saying, yes, you can go on. Uh, there is value whether you are at the venue or not, because Kenyans will be following on television, the world will be following on television and on the digital space. Now, something, uh, two, two, uh, two things that I want, uh, Peter, I wanted to mention is the, you know, you're working with a group of corporates and the direct incentives to, uh, for the Kenyan golfers, 100,000 shillings for any Kenyan who makes cuts, how much um, the incentive is that to them and there is the history making factor that we have a golf deaf Olympian Isaac Makoha 
playing at this tournament. Tell us about that. Uh, the first thing I would say is that um, they, there has been a huge increase in the cost of participation for the local pros. The cost of the bubble in itself uh, means that they have to leave their families, they have to leave their homes and check into a hotel, to the designated hotel at their own cost. So that in itself has brought you know, a huge cost to our pros. Um, that, you, that you're within Nairobi and you cannot go to your home. And instead you are in you know, a fairly high standard hotel where they actually meet. So a lot of corporates have actually come in to support this particular effort and say we don't want our pros you know, to be locked out of the bubble because they could not afford. So we've seen a number of corporates actually putting in funds and mainly these have been as a direct um, incentive to, not incentive, but basically support to enable them participate in the event. The European Tour itself has also put in some money towards our local pros to help them participate in both events, but this money comes at the end of the event. So we actually had to look at it. The real incentive for our pros is not the 100,000 here or there. There is that big prize money in euros. One, one, 131 million. <laughs> that one is what they should be looking at. <laughs> That's what they should be driving them. If they look at the 100,000, they'll have lost the mark. They need to look at the big price for making it into the top 10. Actually, when you make it into the cut, you're already in the money. So you need to make it to the top 10 or win this event so that you can walk out with millions. Yeah, but, I mean, it's what Pierre Lumumba says, following a dick dick and there is an antelope. There you go. And the case of Isaac Makoha, what does it mean for sport? Um, I think number one, um, without going to specifics, okay. is that um, globally, sports, we are all looking to be all inclusive, all around. This is an Olympic year. We know that immediately after the 17 days of the Summer Olympics, we'll go straight into the Paralympics. And every sport, every sport, I think for the last... Uh, 10 years, the IOC has put in a lot of effort to ensure that we are actually going on inclusive. Athletics have done very well. Um, other sports where it is practically possible have looked at very well. And golf has been one of the sports that has going. And to see a Kenyan participate at this is obviously um, a good message to other persons living with uh, disabilities, that basically there are opportunities within sports uh, where they can come in and participate and be part uh, of the big uh, global sporting world. All right. Yeah. Peter Gashiro is the Chief Executive Officer of IMG Kenya Limited. Thank you very much for your time this morning. Give us insight into this and about the extraction of the value of the Magical Kenya Open and the Kenya Savannah Classic. We'll be taking a short break. And after that, let's talk about Agrich Sport Development.